Hi, and um, welcome to another Access Chat um, Redux. Uh, we've got Alistair here from Acuity Design. We um, have a decent internet connection this time, so hopefully we're not going to um, lose out. Uh, we promised we'd uh, revisit the chat because we felt that the um, the Twitter chat last week was fantastic, very successful, a lot of interest, and wanted to revisit that. And looks like we've just lost it. No, uh, I think is I think it's there, but some, uh, Are you there? yeah, just uh, something with the probably something with the speed of the internet connection that just blocked the image. Okay, so that's fine. You're coming back. Okay, so um, realize I've dropped out. That's okay. So um, for the benefit of our viewers, we'll pretend like. Uh, last Tuesday never happened, and um, <laughs> stuff, right. um, so I've obviously come across you for for a while on 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 Twitter now, and you're 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 posting stuff from a very different point of view, um, and then you, your approach to accessibility is really interesting to me because it's coming at stuff from a different angle, and you're talking about things that are not just based around web accessibility. So can you give us a bit of um, background as to how you came into accessibility and what uh, and what it is that Acuity Design do? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I came into it via 3D printing uh, because I was started a 3D print workshop in 2007 and I was interested in doing it for cultural purposes. So a lot of work we started doing was replicating objects and we did work for Scottish Parliament and museums. And then we got into this area that the objects that we were creating, there was a question of what they meant. I mean, what they meant in terms of when you handed them to a blind person or when you, you know, to a person with learning disability. And so I started then going sideways into um, understanding how the senses work and understanding how the cognition of senses works. And that's really where where I've ended up and where Acuity Design hangs up, which is we hang around the area which is actually about comprehension. There's a lot of a lot of accessibility is either about you know, the coding of the delivery of information, but it's not actually about the information you're trying to put across. And um, that's the area I'm really interested in. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Um, a lot of the stuff that. Um, we consider or is traditionally considered to be accessibility is the uh, making of interoperability, the making of stuff work together and, and it's not thinking about the, the, the information that's conveyed underneath. So long as the information is successfully conveyed it doesn't really matter whether or not you've understood it. I think that's not necessarily true when we come to cognitive accessibility which is where my heart also lies. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, especially, you know, and, and we've been working, Deborah and I have been working with Lisa Seaman, who we had on the other week, um, around cognitive accessibility. And, 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 of course, that's different. Actually, quite often, you don't need any tools at all. So, um, quite naturally, the work that you were doing was of, of real interest to me because it's something different. It's about still giving people access to information, but it, in, in ways and means which... Um, i would not really thought about before, um, to be honest. You know, I spend my time buried in the world of technical um, accessibility and delivery, um, despite the fact that that I I find stuff myself quite cognitively challenging from time to time. So, um, can you? Um, yeah, I know you're you're doing um, some work, and you've got a kick. Uh, well, GoFundMe campaign, isn't it for? Um, South by Southwest. Yeah, I, 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 well, it was an um, Indiegogo I had running, which um, was to help with South by Southwest. Because yes, I mean, so last year I, I did South by Southwest last year and did a workshop on sensory user experience and understanding how the senses work um, in design, particularly in the design for wearables, which is an area of interest. And then this year I'm going back. Um, I've been invited back, but this year I'll be talking about um, inclusion and emotion in line of wearable technology. And actually, 
are the most interesting things about wearable tech, and yet they're the most a ignored and b difficult um, areas of design. So that's yes, that's where I'm heading, and that's the chat I'm going to be talking about. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting that that a you're, a, you're going to um, a much more mainstream event, um, and I think that's. That's great. I know that South by Southwest has always had a, a, a small corner of it that is forever accessibility, but it's it's a much more mainstream event than than, than just a sort of um, pure accessibility event. And I think it's really important that that people are going out there and and um, taking accessibility out to the mainstream rather than being insular. So. Yeah. I, I think one of the key ones, and I mean, the reason I talk about sensory user experience more than I talk about accessibility is, to some extent, I'm trying to reverse the direction of the conversation, because the most meaningful design gains for wearable technology are actually discovering the experiences of people with impairments who are using assistive tech. So at the moment, the, what what a lot of people who are designing, you know, the, the general market design of wearables is completely unaware that a lot of what they're attempting, a lot of what they're thinking is new, is actually assistive tech. You know, in the same way that text to speech is, it's an assistive tech. It's just it's spread. Yeah. Um, and so, a lot of my views on inclusion are actually the failure of the general population understand that if they paid attention to people with um, cognitive or physical in impairments, they would actually know more, that the society would be better. Um, and it's it's that sort of direction of travel which I'm interested in, I not to look at the impairment, but actually to look at the capacity. What, what, I, what I found uh, especially interesting in that is, you know, you see big players like like Google when they were, you know, with Google Glass, and uh, in the, the first thing that they were, you know, the first proposal is about uh, oh, um, how to take, they were f focused in areas that are more consumer driven when in fact that could be a brilliant device for assistive tech. Why do you think that, that the even big players like Google have the, uh, the they when they go and then when they have these devices they don't they think in that in that way instead of uh, looking that in, into a more uh, useful way for for people well i mean it's it's two levels really i mean one they're looking at at it from a purely engineering sense so a lot of a lot of the design is trapped by it's being done by software hardware designers who have very focused concepts of what themes should be and B it's it's also the concept of looking for the large enough market looking for I mean certainly with Google Glass it was always and with a lot of wearables it's looking for the killer app looking for the thing which will make the money and that's that's always presumed to be some form of consumer app even though yes I mean you're, you're right it's the, the majority of the things which are really really interesting about Google Glass are to do with accessibility and inclusion. Yeah, I think the, the accessibility com uh, community got very excited about Glass because actually the, there was a lot of potential there uh, to support you know, things like the, um, facial recognition, emotion recognition, all mm. sorts of uh, really interesting things that opened up affordances for, for people with all kinds of of disabilities and and the access the ac accessibility and assistive tech industry was particularly um, interested in the the possibilities that that things like glass presented. So I hope that despite it being discontinued, that that there will continue to be opportunities to to look at this kind of stuff. I, I know that when it comes to wearables. We, my, my company's interested, um, we're involved in trying to foster some innovation in this space. Um, mm. And I've seen some really interesting devices. But I, I also think that, as we've discussed previously, um, users of assistive tech make a fantastic test bed 
um, for new products because the perseverance with the buggy, terrible, clunky interfaces and the um, the error-prone software or hardware is much greater than your average consumer. I, I can uh, uh, from the from the the way I'm talking with people about where where we'll tech on, on people who are going to you know, run and doing exercise and. The idea is that it's fun for a period of time, and they are using it. And then after time, it's it's get it's they are bored with it, and they end up not using it anymore. And and I, I see you know. And while people who, who actually need this in terms of assistive tech, there will be a, a more engaging uh, crowd because they actually need the device in order to to in order to help them in in, in their daily lives. So I think that it's a, a missed opportunity here. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, there's, I mean, the areas which which are interesting if you look at the the work is, I mean, what's known as sensory substitution, which is sort of one of the key assistive tech uses of uh, wearable devices, where changing the modality, changing the the actual sense which is taking in and processing information, where where there's remarkable interesting work. But one of the things, and this comes back to the thing you were just saying about people abandoning wearables, one of the key things which comes up in the research on um, those sorts of technologies is is emotional engagement. And that's that's one of the reasons why emotion turns up in the, the title of my South by Southwest book, is, is that actually it's necessary for somebody to actually really, really feel that the thing matters for it to really actually become part of their their life, to become part of their um, you know embodiment, as we you know they say in cognition terms. So you know this and this this is again why why if you look at assistive tech, general design could learn how to make stuff better, i.e., to make fitness things which people don't abandon. Because it's it's those lessons about how and you know the perseverance that um, Neil was talking about. These these are these are the things, these are the behaviours which actually provide meaning and provide lessons for general design. And this is uh, you know this is comes back to why why assistive tech and why the sort of work in assistive tech actually matters to everyone. I think that's very true. Um, you know we we. You talked about text to speech. Um, again, things like speech recognition, very much um, adopted by the assistive tech community. Even though it was considered a workflow tool, um, you know, the, the, the greatest adoption and the greatest perseverance was was the assistive tech community for a long time before it it reached the stage where it was considered to be consumer grade again. So. Um, and, and, and I think that that feedback and that perseverance and, and um, continued use really help the developers to be able to produce a product that in the end is, is suitable for the mass market. Um, but again, I, I'm completely in agreement with you. You, know, you need, need stuff to work and it needs to be emotionally, um, to, to pay you back, to be emotionally attached to it. I've got a NFC ring here and I love the idea. Um, but because the ecosystem that could support it is very, very limited, m my emotional attachment to it is not as great as it could be and I'm not really using it as much as I, as I, as its potential because all it does is unlock one of my phones because at the moment there are too many restrictions. It's a walled garden. You, there's only so many things you can do with it. I've got two triggers. So I could trigger it to unlock my phone and maybe pass on my contact details. Whereas what I'd like to be able to do is unlock lots of devices um, and pay for stuff. Uh, those, those things where um, I struggle. So I'm always locking myself out of my computer, always locking myself out of my bank account. I'm because I have a sequencing problem. No, because because, 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 so basically, what you, you wanted that the the experience where the object becomes a, an ex improve the extension of yourself. Yeah, and and it's also supporting me in an area where I have a weakness, um, which I I think um, 
for for me that that that's the assistive tech element of it but where it crosses over it's just making life easier for everyone and and once you have products that make life easier for everyone then they hit the mainstream and and, and really really go someplace um, at the moment the, the the problem is around the ecosystem it's around the fact that lots of other there are lots of other players in this market where they've got an interest in making sure that um, that their systems work, um, and and, and ju uh, the guys that made the NFC ring are a, a small outfit. I don't think they can compete with the Visas and the Apples and the the, the Google wallets of this world um, in terms of sewing up deals. Because when it comes to payment systems, which is where it starts to get really useful, and and sort of things like Oyster and everything else. Some really, really large companies have got a, a, a fairly significant amount invested in already in those those areas. So it becomes quite difficult. Um, and I and I think that's one of the areas where um, where accessibility has challenges is that um, where stuff is not open or where there aren't agreed standards, um, it it becomes difficult to to unlock some of the potential of technology. Um, which is why I think that, that standards have a place, but I know that um, they're not the be all and end all. Because we had a really interesting discussion on this on on last Tuesday, which um, which I think was enlightening. And 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 you were you were raising the points as, uh, around um, whether or not you know standards w were too restrictive and 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 and, and put a a block on innovation, so maybe. I think it's it's not so much. Standards have a habit of. I mean, it's 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 a cognitive trap which standards always create, and you you see it in mm -hmm. bureaucracies, and you see it everywhere, which is which is the bias which occurs is somebody writes down a standard, and then when it's handed out to other people, the standard then becomes a measure. I yeah. have you done this. Which is again relatively okay, but then, then, and this is where things break down a bit. Then the standard, the measure becomes a goal, and you start ignoring other things. And it's when you start ignoring other things that things start falling apart, because then the goal, i.e., the standard, which is now a goal, for the engineers, and this is what you see in web accessibility and you see in sort of hardware accessibility, they will meet the standard as it's defined and as it is a goal that they've been told in their engineering specifications. But that means that A, they'll ignore stuff which is, as far as the specification is concerned, less meaningful. So therefore you actually start specifically cutting away minority user groups because they are not part of the standard. Yeah. Um, and B, you start ignoring alternatives because the alternatives are not quite the standard yeah so so it's I, I think you know standards standards are always useful and you know checklists are always useful to make sure you haven't done something stupid or forgotten something but they do haven't as I say it's 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 the problem that people treat standards as goals that's that's where it breaks because then then you lose flexibility, and I think when people have standards and they don't have flexibility, that's that's when you get horrible things happening. As I think you, you mentioned with um, color contrasts and Microsoft um, operating systems nowadays. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. So we effectively cannot customize in the same way that you could uh, could previously because. Um, Older systems, they they allow a great deal of customization. Um, newer ones, where they've got certain schemes in, they've got high contrast scheme in, but not everyone likes the high contrast scheme, me included. Um, and you don't have that granularity. And when we've taken this up with with Microsoft, they've gone, oh well, that's by design. And so yes, effectively yeah. they've, they've they've designed exclusion into their product where it wasn't before. Yeah, and that's because because the standard has created a goal, 
and then it's been also then slightly twisted by people saying we want to guarantee the UX and you know we wish to guarantee the UX is one of the great traps because it it takes control away from the user it says we wish to you know for your benefit we wish to eliminate features to make sure the thing is um, <laughs> and quality of experience no, yes. no, no. it's that break there which which is a problem do you think this could be related with with their uh, background the, the way i uh, know because the, the, we are talking about wearables there's a lot of uh, a mix of uh, you know knowledge that is required in order to understand how to make wearables work and useful do you think that the 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 training or that they have received or even when they were at university or studying do you think that uh, Today, if, if you want to be in, in this space, if you want to be an engineer for wearables, you need, a comp uh, 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 you need to have a, a set of skills that is different from the one that they teach in the engineering schools? Yeah, I mean, it's in wearables and, you know, in, in, in a lot of the sort of, if you look at cognitive UX, um, you're talking about, the problem is we're talking about subjects which used to be not meaningful to engineering because I mean you know you're talking about and I, I you know literally this afternoon I've been reading uh, a book called um, Design for Design or Design for Design, which is which is a it's a very new book um, by um, Thomas Wendt and it's utilizing the philosophy of Heidegger to try and design technology you know to design UX. Because what he's arguing, and this is a reasonable argument, is you need to understand the philosophy of embodiment and embodied cognition and how the senses and the body work together to actually engineer user experiences that are meaningful. And as I say, when you have engineering, engineering has still got an awfully, awfully old fashioned idea of how human bodies, senses and cognition work. And and that means they can't be aware of how how these things are all related to each other. And so they're they're aware of certain bits, but they don't know the totality. And that's you know, I and mean, that's why I run the the sensory UX workshops, is to actually force people through an experience of understanding their senses and how their memory and their um, Cognition works because it's it's the bit they don't they don't hear about. So it is is a bit like um, they have in architecture. Um, to, do you think that this is something that we should be uh, including in the curricula going going forwards? Because I, I think that quite often when we're talking about web accessibility, we we end up saying, well, you know, we're teaching people how to use computers. We're teaching people how to create properties and things on the web, but we're not teaching people about accessibility at that the point that we're teaching the skills that they create stuff. So if we do, um, if we, we, we follow that to its logical conclusion, we should also be teaching people about uh, designing for the senses, um, especially since the web is melding into the internet of things and you've got all of these connected devices and sensors in your phone and sensors on your um, your fitness band or your watch or in your trainers or whatever. Do you think do you think that that should be part of the curriculum? Well, I think it's as I say with with a lot of it and you know the work I've been doing for the last couple of years. It's digital means that things which used to be as such merely metaphysical or merely philosophical have actually become relevant because you know digital has de-physicalized information and it's created strange moments um, because I mean to, to be honest if you if you look at accessibility most of the code I mean most of the digital accessibility is actually nothing to do with users because it's all about how is information rendered between one computer system and another computer system. Yeah. It's not interoperability. The users. Yeah. yeah. The, the interoperability, it's it's nothing to do with users, accessibility in, on the web. It's it's about how does my system oops, 
We can still hear you. Yeah. Um, it's about how does my system, or no, how does your information as you've designed it, render upon my system? So it's it's actually, it's only half a conversation because it doesn't actually include the human beings. And that's, that's where a lot of the stuff to do with um, the future goes because the future ends up in a discussion of understanding human senses, human cognition, and how they all relate together. You know, I mean, again, coming back to um, the web standards on cognitive accessibility. You know, there's, it's very much like some of the, the new work which is discussing design for physical environment as a cognitively accessible concept by talking about accessibility in the physical environment, not merely in terms of ramps and assistive tech, but in terms of how does this space actually make sense to people with, um, you know, whatever, sort of a spectrum of, you know, sensory capacities, yeah. sense of um, sensitivities. Okay. And that's, again, very interesting. And it's, it's those things which are, which are design, you know, are fundamental design idea. And they're, they're inclusive because the ideas of cognitive impairment, the ideas of sensory um, sensitivity or um, impairment, I mean, all of those drift across between people who, you know, are distracted. You know, this, this is the attention economy, as it's also described. The attention economy is about distraction. So if a person has got cognitive impairments, that's one thing, but then that's many of the use cases also drift to, um, you know, a father who's got two children who are running around and he's trying to pay attention to while trying to do something else. You know, there, there are use cases and there are inclusive use cases in cognitive design, which includes everyone. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, when we're talking about cognitive load, um, there are always going to be situations where reducing the cognitive load is of benefit to everyone and there are plenty of times where you're just through sheer volume of work or or your surroundings that experience a, a, a cognitive load which is effectively disabling regardless of whether or not you have a cognitive impairment so um, I'm, I'm fully with you there. Um, I also think that the, the stuff about um, you can design a, a perfectly technically accessible product that's still completely unusable. Um, and, and one of the joys of, of working in the sort of cognitive space is actually the crossover between usability and accessibility. You hopefully design something that is a well-rounded, usable, joyous thing. Um, doesn't always work out that way, but that's, that's the aim anyway. Um, to, to, to give something that, that has meaning and, and gives satisfaction and enables someone to do to do something um, and doesn't put them through the pain barrier whilst they're doing it. Yeah, I mean it's it's um, it's, it's an area. I mean it's 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 an area which I've I've been looking at a lot of late. You know, there's there's as the U.S. Army discusses it, it's neuroergonomics. It's it's ideas of creating technology which is responsive to the cognitive load of the user. I devices designing devices that are actually emotionally aware, so that they can adjust the information load, or the con you know the content, or the way it's displayed, depending upon how stressed the person is. And that's you know that's that's the technology in the next five to ten years. I technology which is actually paying attention to our our cognitive needs. I think that's fascinating, um, particularly because we we tend to forget how much the the militaries had to play in in in, in product design. Uh, you know, the early usability standards were driven by the military. Yeah. It's a life and death situation, so um, often that 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 forced them to put together the early usability standards, but. Um, you know, it's not whether or not I can complete the transaction, it's whether or not I can carry out something that's either going to save my life or, or put me in harm's way. So, um, yeah. so, so um, you know, what the military is doing usually is high quality and uh, I, I know that there's all sorts of, you know, really 
cool stuff happening in DARPA, and I know you've pointed out that there's reams of military research available on some of the websites, which is which you pointed to me to previously fascinating stuff. I just don't have enough hours in the day to read it all. No, no, no. But then, I mean, the, the other place which which is interesting is to look at the where they're putting their money. Uh, so that you can actually look up because it's U.S. Army. Uh, you can actually look up their um, where they're funding next, and you can find the researchers they're funding. Yes, which, which is interesting because then it allows you to track down their research. This yes. is the business of the web. Um, so yeah, you you can actually start seeing what the future is because you can actually see where where a lot of this design research is going. Both you know in this sort of slightly strange sort of crossover between uh, military and academic research. But all of this, all of this is available. And it's, you know, this is the stuff which which defines the future. Because, of course, I mean, the US Army particularly has well been heavily involved in a lot of assistive tech in the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, so um, from from the number of wars. So, you know, again, they're well, well aware of, of, of a lot of these issues. Yeah. Um, so it's... So it's 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 interesting that you know you probably see more interesting cognitive work or design work over in these areas than you see in the UX or work within um, wearables, and that's that's you know this this is this is the thing which I find interesting is that you you can bring across both accessibility technology and military technology to actually talk about new forms of technology, new forms of um, technology for everyone, which creates a more inclusive society and a more contented society. Well, it may be ironic, but it is possible. Yeah. No, it's a so if if you know we we know that's quite a good number of noise about wearable tech, but th these topics that you are talking about, is there a place or where people are actually having this type of debate, or everybody is keeping this for themselves and is not really a, a debate ab about these topics, and that's why the reason why you are highlighting this in 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 that way. Uh, I think it's why I'm highlighting it in this way is is because it's 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 unnoticed, and you know the 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 way that the wearable technology has become purely about fitness and purely about notifications, which which seems <laughs> depressing, um, because because not because not because fitness or notifications are depressing inherent entirely by themselves. But that you could do so much more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the quanti quantified self in terms of number of Snickers bars that I've eaten is not really the the ideal Internet of Things future that I dreamed of. No, uh, I, I do, uh, if, uh, I'd say probably a year ago, um, I, in, here in the Cork Institute of Technology, they, they were doing. They, they had a professor that from uh, I think it was MIT that was working with them. And he was describing his journey to the Internet of Things. And in the beginning, he was, oh, we have all these objects, we're trying to connect them. But then we're not able able to understand what to do with it, uh, how they were able to operate. And then I asked, so, but how do you find the solution for it? Oh, we need to create a, multi, a, a team with people from different areas, sociologists, psychologists. And then things start to make sense for the engineers. Yeah, I, I think this is, and again, it comes to back to a lot of the ideas of how to have UX teams or product development teams, is you just need more people in them from different backgrounds. And again, this is, comes back to sort of the ideas of trying to bring in the experience and bring in the knowledge of people with physical or cognitive impairments, because they're the people who know what the future might look like. And if you ignore people who have been through assistive tech, experiences, you're ignoring the possibility of... Not available. Hmm? Connect to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Device is listening to you. Um, <laughs> um, yes, that. Um, no, it's, it's... You need the multi... You know, this is why you need the teams which have broader senses of understanding of the human nature of things. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, that, that's, that's very true. So um, we've reached the end of our, our time. Um, thank you very much. It's been, it's been really great chatting with you again, and this time we've captured it. So um, I, I hope you have a fantastic trip to South by Southwest. We'll we'll um, get this up on the website shortly. Uh, uh, are, are the session your session going to be recorded in video or any? Um, I don't actually know. I mean, there will be slides, but um, I've really no idea what what. I presume it might be recorded in audio. Okay. Okay. But um, yeah, but um, so yeah, no, it'll be interesting, and um, and well, yes, more will happen later in the year. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you know, keep us posted on the time slot, and we'll um, we'll definitely try and, and, and tweet about it. And, and if, if it is on video or or streamed, in we'll, we'll live tweet about it if possible. Okay. Great. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you kindly. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.